All right, so the reason I chose uh, Psalm chapter 91 is uh, because it actually is a um, prophecy of Jesus Christ. Um, and you'll find in Matthew, I think, Matthew 4, um, where uh, Jesus is tempted of the devil, and, you know, the devil actually quotes this to him, um, you know, that uh, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So it's just because that had, it was a prophecy of Jesus Christ, but also it's about talking about how we can also call upon the Lord, and he'll give us these same promises too. Um, but the, the uh, title of the sermon tonight is Calling Upon the Name of the Lord. Um, so today we'll look at some aspects of calling upon the name of the Lord. And the first one is for salvation. And it's clearly seen throughout the Bible as people call upon the Lord by faith, starting in Genesis chapter 4. You don't have to turn there, but I'll get you to turn to Isaiah 12. In Genesis 4, 26, 25 and 26, it says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, says she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name Enos, and then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So you'll be there in Isaiah 12. Um, but calling upon the Lord is essential to being saved. And it's not necessarily an outward expression that you have to actually say words, but uh, you will call upon the Lord when you believe in your heart. Uh, and in Isaiah chapter 11, that's a chapter about the branch of Jesse, which we know is about Jesus Christ, because in Romans 15, 12, it says, And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. So that's obviously, chapter 11 is about Jesus Christ, a prophecy. And chapter 12 is as well. So we'll start in verse 1 in Isaiah 12. It says, And in that day shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee, that though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall you say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. So just note the language that's used here. Um, Jehovah has become my salvation. Now we know Jehovah is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, but in the Old Testament it was one of his names. Um, but it also mentions drawing the water out of the wells of salvation. And in this context, I believe it's prophesying of Jesus Christ, his salvation, and also the Holy Ghost. Um, so turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. So we'll start in uh, verse 11 of Jeremiah 2. It says, uh, Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. I'll get you to turn to Jeremiah 17, just over a few pages. But this is speaking of Israel, and they're having and worshipping other gods, uh, not the God of their fathers, uh, and not the Lord God Jehovah. Um, but I like that language there, they've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. In Jeremiah 17, it says something very similar. We'll start in verse 12. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. So I'll get you to turn to John chapter 4 in the New Testament. But again, we see similar wording here in John. Um, but but uh, I just you know you notice in uh, Jeremiah 17 it says they've forsaken the Lord, whereas in, in Jeremiah 2 it says they've forsaken me. You know, just clearly making reference there that that is the Lord he's speaking of also in Jeremiah 2. Um, but in John chapter 4, we'll start in verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God. So now what's the gift of God? Anyone who's a soul winner knows what the gift of God, God is. 
Um, you know, according to Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in Luke 11.13, which we're also going to read again later, it says, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Um, so the gift of eternal life, but it's also the gift of the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. It's a gift given to us when we call upon the Lord to be saved. Um, so again in verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence thou hast this living water? So she didn't understand, of course, he's speaking spiritually um, of eternal life and the Holy Ghost. And she thinks, you know, it's, it's, she's looking carnally and thinking about actually digging from the well and bringing water up for herself. Um, Christ clarifies that for her. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So I'll get you to turn just over to John chapter 7. But again, the language is similar here. It's a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Uh, and the language in the Old Testament and the New Testament is, is very similar, describing both these things about the salvation of Jesus Christ. Um, we'll start in verse 37 in John 7. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Christ was not yet glorified. So these passages from Isaiah and Jeremiah you know, I believe are uh, strong indicators of uh, prophecies of Jesus Christ. And the same things he taught in the New Testament as well in John and in the Gospels about himself and the Holy Ghost and the free gift of sal salvation and eternal life. So you'll see a lot of references in the Old and New Testament um, where people are calling upon the Lord for salvation, um, showing also that all scripture, even the Old Testament, points to Christ. So I'll get you to turn to Psalm 53. And I'll just read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2, it says, Under the church, uh, we, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, so the saints is us, with all that in every place call upon the name of, our Lord, of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, it's, it's likening saints with those who call upon Jesus Christ. Um, and we as saints have called upon the name of the Lord and we believe the gospel which was preached unto us. We receive the Holy Ghost of promise and are children of the Father. Um, but there are also those who, are not, who have not called upon the name of the Lord and we'll see that in Psalm 53. Starting in verse 1, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. Corrupt are they and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand that did seek God. Every one of them is gone back. They are altogether become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread? They have not called upon God. There were, there were they in great fear, where no fear was, for God hath scattered the bones of him that encampeth against thee. Thou hast put them to shame, because God hath despised them. O oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion, when God bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice and Israel shall be glad. So if that sounds familiar, it's because this is also found in Romans uh, chapter 3, verse 10 to 19. And we use those same verses in the Romans road when we go out soul winning. Uh, it just shows that all have sinned and there are none righteous before God. So, uh, you know, the only time you have righteousness is if you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, called upon his name, and you have the righteousness of Christ imputed unto you. So I'll read for you Psalm 79, verse 6. Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that have not known thee and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. So again, not knowing the Lord is likened to those who have not called upon him, upon his name, who have called upon God, as it said in Psalm 53. I'll get you to turn to Proverbs chapter 1. 
Now, this is a chapter, I, I believe it's uh, speaking about reprobates, people who are rejected of God, and they call upon the Lord but are unable to believe. But we'll start in verse 20. It says, Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of, of concourse, in the openings of the gates, in the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called, and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would not of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your faith cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall thou eat of the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices." For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. So it says here, they call upon the Lord, but he will not answer. And I believe this is just saying, for some it's too late. We understand the reprobate doctrine. Um, but this sermon isn't about reprobates, but I just wanted to show the language here. Um, for those who have not called upon the name of the Lord, or those who have called... Um, those who don't know him, and for some who will call upon the Lord even as reprobates. But we know that they can't believe in their heart, so their calling is in vain. That's why the Lord doesn't hear them. Um, so I'm thankful that Pastor Kevin preached this last week, um, so it's still fresh in our minds. Um, I'll get you to go to Luke 23. So you've got these groups, you've got those who have not called upon the name of the Lord, which is just the unsaved. There are those who, even if they call upon the Lord, they are rejected and the Lord will not hear them. But you've got one more and perhaps more well-known example of calling on, on the Lord for salvation, which is the thief on the cross. Um, we're all pretty familiar with that. We'll start in verse 39 in Luke 23. It says, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So you could also see two men here, one who feared the Lord and called out for him to be saved, and the other who didn't fear God and actually was railing on him um, and attacking him for being in the same predicament he was in. So, I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense for us, but um, it's also... Salvation in, you know, in its most simple form. He just believed and confessed with his mouth. Um, and, and it brings us to the next point. Why do we do this when we're out knocking doors? So I'll get you to turn to Romans 10. And again, all the soul winners will be very familiar with this. But we'll start in verse 8 of Romans chapter 10. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For as I said, Lord, who hath believed their report? So, and a lot of people like to say that this passage negates John 3.16 because we're teaching that you have to call upon the Lord. But it actually confirms it because it says confession is made, uh, salvation begins in the heart, and believing unto righteousness is confession with the mouth. So it's two important parts that we must do, you know, when, when we're out soul winning and, and when, when you call upon the Lord. The first step is to believe in your heart and then you're going to call out 
uh, from your heart, Lord, save me. You know, whether it's verbal or not uh, is another thing entirely. Um, we won't turn there, but in Matthew 14, you've got Peter and Jesus walking on water, uh, which is a picture of salvation. Uh, Peter recognizes he's in need of salvation, uh, so he calls out to the Lord to save him. And while the event is about physical salvation, it's a picture of the spiritual. Um, it's just calling upon the Lord and believing in your heart that he can save him. Now, Peter also had doubt in his heart, which is why he, he went underwater in the first place. Um, but that'll be later in the sermon. I'll get you to turn to Psalm 116. And this psalm's interesting because it covers multiple aspects of calling upon the name of the Lord. It leads into the next point, which is calling upon the Lord after salvation. So we start at verse 1, Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compass me, and the pains of hell get hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord house, of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. So again, one thing you find many times, it's not just in the Psalms, also throughout all the Old Testament, and even the New Testament, it's calling upon the Lord for a physical salvation, and sometimes even just to exalt and praise his name, as David was doing here. Um, I'll read for you Psalm 55, but I'll get you to turn to Psalm 86. Psalm 55, verse 15, it says, Let death seize upon them. And let them go down quick into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud. And he shall hear my voice. He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. For there were many with me. God shall hear and afflict them. Even he that abide, abideth of old, Selah. Because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. Again, we see not fearing God with the wicked always coming up. Um, but also here, calling upon the Lord is synonymous with praying and crying aloud to the Lord for him to physical salvation, even to praise his name. So in Psalm 86, in verse 1, Bow down thine ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Be merciful unto me, O Lord. For I cry unto thee daily. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great and doest wonderful things, thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord, I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud arisest against me. And the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul and have not set thee before them. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. O turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant and save the son of thy handmaid. 
Show me a token for good that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed, because thou, Lord, thou Lord, hast holpen me and comforted me. So I'll get you to turn across to Psalm 99. But I like how here in David, uh, in Psalm 86, he's calling upon God for his mercy, and then he cries unto the Lord daily. And our prayers to the Lord should be daily also. We should be praying to him at all times, even all throughout the day, not just one time a day, but all throughout the day, every day, we should be praying to God, praising his name, asking for things, and just spending time with him. It's just very important to have that fellowship with our Father. So in Psalm 99, verse 1, The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims, let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion and is high above all the people. Let them praise thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. The king's strength also loveth judgment. Thou doest, thou dost establish equity. Thou executest judgment and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among them that call upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spake unto them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. Thou answerest them, O Lord our God. Thou wast a God that forgavest them, though thou tookest vengeance on their inventions. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. So again, we see here the fathers of our faith, they all called upon the name of the Lord. Um, mentions here specifically, you know, Moses and Aaron and the priests and Samuel. Um, but they called upon him not just for salvation, but also for the daily petitions of the people. Moses would always call upon the Lord and speak with him face to face um, and was able to put those petitions and also to receive new commandments and ordinances from them as well. And we also know that because of this, whatever we ask of him, he will hear us. Um, so we'll turn to Psalm 145. In verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. My mouth shall speak of the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. So I'll get you to turn to Jeremiah 29. In the context of this next passage, it's about trusting in the Lord. Um, they call upon him and they'll be saved from their captivity. It's about the captivity when they're in Babylon for 70 years. And as they're coming out of that captivity, um, this, is, this is something God's saying to them. Um, but it starts with them believing and hearkening to the words of the Lord. Well, it starts in verse 10, I believe. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished to Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good work toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Again, likening, calling upon him uh, with prayer. In verse 13, and you, shall, and you shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all your heart. Again, this is contrasted with Proverbs 1, where they'll seek after him, but they will not find him, and he will not answer them with the reprobates. Um, verse 14, And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again to the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. So you can see clearly again, you know, calling upon the Lord not just for salvation, um, but it's something we should do daily. Acts 2.41, I won't get you to turn there. Um, it just says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. So it's not only when we're alone in our prayer closet that we should pray, but it's also when we're here publicly, and that's why we have our prayer meetings on a Friday night is that when we gather together, we also should meet together, sing, sing hymns and, and preaching and pray, uh, as they did with the apostles. So even if it's just to praise him or to pray, which praying just means to ask for something, um, that we should call upon the Lord always and he will hear our prayers. 
Um, I'll get you to turn to uh, Luke chapter 11. I'll read for you Philippians 4, 6. It says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. How do we do that? We do that through prayer, um, just by asking him, uh, making our requests known unto God. So you're in Luke 11. I'll read for you Matthew 7. We'll get to Luke 11 in just a second. In verse 7 in Matthew 7, it says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if your son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. It's just saying to, you know, to love your neighbor. Um, we'll get again, again, we'll get to that a bit later. And verse 9 in Luke 11 follows on from this as well. It's the same story, but, but I believe perhaps a different time because it's quoted a little bit differently. It says, And I say unto you, Ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give for fish, give him a serpent? serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? I like verse 13 here, which we read before. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Um, so here we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost if we ask. But you need to believe in your heart and call upon the Lord. Um, and at that moment is when you receive the Holy Ghost. So we'll uh, turn to John 16. This is along the same vein. We'll start in verse 23 of John 16. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name, ask and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father to you, for the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me, and hath believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and I'm coming to the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. So our Father in heaven wants us to call upon him, because we love his Son, and we believe his Son died for us. We're also loved of the Father. Um, and he's waiting to bless us, bless us if we seek his kingdom and his will. Um, so how can we apply this to ourselves? So I'm going to show a few ways we can call upon the Lord in our daily prayer. Um, we've already seen the Psalms, Isaiah and Jeremiah, that praying for physical strength and physical salvation from our enemies and from evil. That's something we should also do. Um, but we should also ask for those things that are given in examples in the Lord's Prayer. So that's in Matthew 6, if you want to turn there. Matthew 6, verse 6. It says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be ye not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. Um, so then he gives us the Lord prayer, Lord's Prayer in uh, verse 9. After this manner pray ye, the, pray ye of our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. So here it includes praise, asking for protection and for your daily needs, our daily bread, which our daily bread is both food uh, but it's also the word of God, which we also need daily. So in Matthew 4, it says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And in John 6, it says, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. 
Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that which gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. No, like the woman at the well, they didn't understand either this is a, a spiritual thing that he's offering here. But uh, he said, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So there's that water of life again as well. Um, so the bread we should seek daily, it's the Lord and his word. Uh, and these are the, it's a great pattern to follow when you pray, not to be repeated vainly, as of course we know that a lot of the um, Catholics and Protestants do. Um, but the God wants us to pray from the heart and ask those things that we have desire of and to pray for the, the needs that we have because he knows what our needs are. So when we pray according to that and according to his will, then he will bless us greatly. I'll get you to turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But there in Luke, Luke chapter 11, verse 13, we read the good gift of the Father was also called the Holy Spirit. Um, therefore, as saints, we have the Holy Ghost and we can pray for the Holy Ghost to teach us and guide us. If you don't understand something you're reading the Scriptures, just call upon the Lord and ask Him to reveal it to you. So in verse 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. So the things of God, we can't understand them without the Spirit of God. So it's only after we're saved and we have the Holy Ghost that we can then ask the Holy Ghost to please explain what this means and um, to help us out with those, with those mysteries of God. Um, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. That's all the promises in the Scriptures, uh, that we know that they all apply to us. And we can know that through the Holy Ghost. Uh, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I'll get you to turn to John 16. It says here in verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you the things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. And all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. So again, if you're saved and have the Holy Ghost, you're able to learn all things in Scriptures through Him. Um, I won't get you to turn to James chapter 5, but another thing we can pray for is, is people who are sick, especially in the church. In James chapter 5, it says, uh, I'll get you to turn to James chapter 1. In James chapter 5, verse 13, it says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing, sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So praying for the sick as well, which we do just about every week. There's always somebody with something in this church. But, um, it's very important that we pray for the sick, not just in our own personal time, but also as a church. Um, in James chapter 1, um, well, Proverbs is a really good book to learn about the wisdom of God. So we're going to look at also praying for wisdom. I highly recommend if, if you don't read the book of Proverbs uh, frequently that you do so because it honestly contains uh, just timeless wisdom um, from God. Um, and it also speaks about not just how to get wisdom but how precious it is, how we should cherish wisdom, how we should always seek after it and seek after the knowledge of God. Because they're all tied in together. The fear of the Lord, the, uh, the wisdom, knowledge and understanding of the word is all tied in together. And we should always be seeking after wisdom. So, but in James chapter 1 verse 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. 
But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So wisdom is something we should ask God for. Uh, Because he says he will give it to us if we ask boldly and with unwavering faith. So if you lack wisdom, it might be because you've not asked, or it might be because when you asked, you didn't ask with unwavering faith. Uh, you, so it says here, if you, you um, this is in verse 7, For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord, talking about the one that wavereth. Um, so if you want something from the Lord, you need to ask with unwavering faith and with boldness and to believe it. Um, so in Proverbs 2, Verse 6, you don't have to turn there. It says, For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. So again, if you want to understand these things, you want to understand the word of God, God's judgment, um, then you need to have wisdom. And with wisdom also comes knowledge and understanding. So that's why it's so important to pray for wisdom. Because God says he will give it to us. We just need to ask him and believe that he will give it to us. Um, Proverbs chapter 4, um, verse 5. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not and she shall preserve thee. Love her and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom and with all thy getting get understanding. So again, just drilling home, it's important for us to ask for wisdom because if you want wisdom, if you want knowledge and understanding and you want to understand the mysteries of God, then that comes through wisdom. It comes through the wisdom of God and the Holy Spirit. So I'll get you to turn to Mark chapter 11 and I'll just read to you from Matthew chapter 21, verse 21. It says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, um, be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. So again, it says, Have faith and doubt not. Uh, you need to ask in prayer, believing in order to receive. So you're there in Mark chapter 11. Look down at verse 23. It says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive. If ye have ought against any that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. So we see here again um, about how Peter obviously had doubts when he was on the water, and that's why he sank. Um, If we need to pray when we ask God, we need to do it with boldness and without doubt. We need to believe that whatever we say, whatever we ask for, that he's able to deliver that. Um, But it's also important here, as it says, um, also it's said in the Lord's Prayer, but also here, if we, you know, it says, um, forgive others your debts, um, and the Lord will forgive your debts. Well, it also says here, if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. So it's important for us to also have a clear conscience before God when we pray. Um, so we can enter boldly into the throne room of grace, and we can confess our trespasses before the Lord, make it right with our brother beforehand, um, but then we can ask the Lord for our protection from evil. We can ask him for our daily bread and the things we need and the things we desire, but only after we've, we've confessed to the Lord and we keep a short account with him. So we, again, we need to confess and daily repent of our sins and our trespasses to, to God. Um, so we also saw that unforgiveness causes you not to be right with God, as well as not believing with unwavering faith when you ask. And these are things that will hinder your prayers. Um, get you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. And verse 14 of Matthew 6. It says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your, will your Father forgive your trespasses. So again, if we go to God looking for mercy for our sins and mercy for 
whatever reason, and we haven't shown mercy on our brother, and we haven't forgiven them of their trespasses, then the Lord's not going to show that mercy on us. So again, you need, need to keep a short account with God and make sure you treat your brothers with love. In Matthew 5, if you want to turn there, in verse 22, it says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. So again, I believe God wants us to reconcile our issues and our trespasses with our brothers before we go to him in prayer uh, or, or give offerings. And we do see that again a little bit later. Um, but another thing that can hinder your prayers is, of course, worldliness. Uh, I'll get you to turn to First uh, John chapter 2. And I'll read to you from James chapter 4. It says, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. So if you're seeking the things of the world, then your prayers are going to be hindered. And it does continue in the next verse. That whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And in Matthew 6.33 it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Of course, talking about food and raiment. Um, but again, if we seek first the kingdom and not our own lusts and not things that are just going to satisfy us on this earth, but we're actually seeking things for the will of God, um, then it says, you know, he, these things will be given to us. Uh, it's about your heart and why you're asking. Um, another thing is wickedness and unrighteousness. These will also hinder your prayers. So we'll turn to Isaiah chapter 1. And this is, of course, speaking to the children of Israel, starting in verse 10 of Isaiah chapter 1. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom, Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. There are trouble, they are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. So again, you know, it also says in First Peter chapter 3, verse 11, let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So I'll get you to turn to uh, John chapter 15. So that, that, there are just a few reasons why the Lord may not hear your prayers. Um, but if we do what's right in the sight of the Lord, we will be heard. Um, love your brethren and keep the commandments of the Lord. Thou shalt have no other gods before me and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So just to be clear, you don't need to do any of these things to be saved. We're not talking about salvation. We know that salvation is by grace through faith. Um, and it's not of works, nor is it going to keep you saved. Once saved, always saved. You're eternally secured that moment you believe and you receive the Holy Ghost. So these are just for fellowship with the Father and walking righteously with the Lord and that your prayers be not hindered. So I'll read to you 1 John chapter 1, uh, verse 5. Then this is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. 
and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So that's how we have fellowship with the Father. Um, he wants us to walk in his commandments. Uh, in John 15, starting verse 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So that's, again, that's the stipulation there. If you want to be friends of God, you need to keep his commandments. Um, again, not for salvation, but just, just so you can walk with him and fellowship with him, and he'll listen to your prayers when you ask. It says, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends, for the things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. So again, that's what, it, what it's all about. So that when we ask the Lord, when we go before him in his throne room, we can boldly ask him for things. Know we have a clear conscience. And he says he will give, you know... Whatsoever you ask, he may give it to you. So in 1 John chapter 3, in verse 18, it says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abide in us by the Spirit which he hath given to us. So again we see here, you know, firstly it's to have no other gods before me. It's the first commandment. The second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. It says if you do these two things, as he gave us commandment, then God will dwell in you and you in him. And we know that he abides in us because we have that spirit of promise that he gave unto us. Um, so just turn over the page to uh, 1 John chapter 5. And it's just verse 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Um, so the last point I'll make tonight is that our prayers will also be part of God's judgment. Um, so if you ever start to think that maybe your prayers don't mean much to God and they're just uh, something for you, um, then I think reading these uh, passages of Scripture, we turn to Revelation chapter 5. These passages here, really do let us know how much God cares for our prayers and he cares for our well-being, the well-being of the saints. We'll start in verse 1 of chapter 5. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. So God has been storing these um, from the beginning of time. He's been storing the prayers of the saints uh, in golden vials of odors. And we'll actually see in Revelation chapter 8, if you want to turn there, in verse 1. What happens with these vials? So when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. 
And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. And the seven angels which had seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So here we've got the judgment of God coming upon the earth after the rapture, of course. Um, but it says here, he remembers our prayers as he pours out his judgment. Um, and our, our prayers actually help to fuel the wrath of God at this time, um, which is just an amazing thing. Is he's remembering all the times that we've cried out for our enemies, that we've returned, they've returned evil f for good, you know, um, that, that we've been good to them and they've returned evil to us. Or, you know, those who have been persecuted through tribulations, um, those who are going to lose their heads in, in, you know, during this time, the great tribulation. Um, God's going to remember the prayers of all these saints and all those who are persecuted or killed for the name of Jesus Christ. So he's kept them all for such a time. And it's just amazing. I think it's amazing that, you know, our prayers are a sweet-smelling savour unto God, that it's an incense unto him, that at this time he's keeping them and storing them and he's just going to remember us as he unleashes his wrath on the world. Um, so in Psalm 141, it's the last place we'll turn tonight, starting in verse 1. It says here, Lord, I cry unto thee, make haste unto me, give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, keep the door of my lips. Incline not my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity, and let me not eat of their dainties. Let the righteous smite me, it shall be a kindness, and let him reprove me, it shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head, for yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. When their judges are overthrown in stony places, they shall hear my words, for they are sweet. Our bones are scattered at the grave's mouth, as when one cutteth and cleaveth wood upon the earth. But mine eyes are unto thee, O God, o God the Lord, in thee is my trust. Leave not my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares which they have laid for me and the gins of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets, whilst that I withal escape. So I love this. Here. You know, he's praying for the destruction of his enemies, but also for his own protection, as well as saying, you know, my, my prayers, um, let them be an incense unto you, God, and let, let the raising of my hands, you know, be like a sacrifice unto you, that, that it would be pleasing to the Lord. So this is a conclusion. If you haven't called upon the Lord to be saved, and your sins are not forgiven, then, you know, feel free. We'll speak to any of us because we'll happily uh, preach you the gospel of Jesus Christ, teach you what it means to be saved. But for those of you who are saved, you know, I've just got a question for you. And that's, you know, how's your prayer life? Like, how often do you pray? Do you call upon the Lord every day? Do you think about the Lord every day? Um, you know, do you give him your burdens? Do you ask for your needs and desires? Uh, and how much time do you spend? Do you spend a lot of time throughout the day or is it just once and you're done like spend some good fellowship with the father you know he really appreciates that and the more the more we do the more he'll bless us um so yeah just call upon his name and he will receive you um do you mind praying brother callum